Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. In the early 2000s, the St. Louis Rams were known as the greatest show on turf. Well, back in the late 40s and early 1950s, the Los Angeles Rams could have also been known as the same. At a time when most football teams were still running and pounding the ball, the Rams were causing fits for opposing defenses with an aerial attack unlike anyone had ever seen. And the main target was Tom Fears. The league's first Mexican-born player was unstoppable. And on this episode of Sports Forgotten Heroes, we take a look back at the record-setting career of Tom Fears. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello and welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes episode 97 and the first episode of 2021, Tom Fears. I hope everyone had a great holiday season and that 2021 turns out to be a much better year for everyone as opposed to the misery that 2020 brought upon us. As always, I will do my part by helping you all escape with my little podcast here where you can put your worries aside for an hour or so and just listen to the stories of stars who great careers have faded away with time. And today, me and my guest, Lee Elder, who has joined me on a few previous episodes of Sports Forgotten Heroes, will do our best to tell you about one of the NFL's all-time great split ends, Tom Fears. It's actually pretty amazing that the name Tom Fears is not spoken about more. When he broke in with the Rams in 1948, he caught an impressive 51 passes. But in 1949, he became the favorite target of Ram quarterbacks. And they had a couple of good ones during his time with the team, Bob Waterfield and Norm Van Brocklin. In 1949, Fears hauled in an NFL record 77 passes. But it was a short-lived record because one year later, he broke that with 84 catches, including a game against the Green Bay Packers in which he caught 18 passes, a record that wouldn't be broken until Terrell Owens caught 20 in a game in 2000. Yes, Tom Fears was an incredible talent, and he was a football lifer. After his playing days ended, he became a coach under Vince Lombardi and worked his way up the ladder and was eventually named coach of the expansion New Orleans Saints. The Saints, well, back then, they were a team devoid of talent, and after just three years with New Orleans, Fears was let go with an overall record of 13 wins, 34 losses, and two ties. His days in the game were far from over, and we'll get into all of it with Lee Elder, who, as I said, has been my guest on previous episodes of Sports Forgotten Heroes, including a terrific discussion about Hall of Fame quarterback Benny Friedman. Lee is also a member of the Professional Football Researchers Association. Check out their website at profootballresearchers.org. 
Hey, you can also check out my website for more information about Sports Forgotten Heroes. Tom Fears and all the Forgotten Heroes I talk about at sportsfh.com. There I have links to videos and more stories about guys like Tom Fears. And it's where you can make contact with me to make suggestions for more forgotten stars to talk about. Send in questions or just let me know how I'm doing. Again, that's sportsfh.com. Please follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter at SportsFHeroes. Look for the Sports Forgotten Heroes page on Facebook or Instagram. And please subscribe wherever you listen. And if it's on Apple Podcasts, give Sports Forgotten Heroes a five-star rating. As always, I thank you for your support and for listening. Hey, one more note. Sports Forgotten Heroes is now a member of the all-new Sports History Network. Check it out at sportshistorynetwork.com. This is one site where you can find many podcasts all dedicated to giving you great choices for learning more about sports history. Okay, now that we got all that out of the way, let's turn our attention back to today's topic, the great split end from the Los Angeles Rams, Tom Fears, and let's get into it with my guest, the Elder. And now joining me once again, a friend of the show, Lee Elder. Lee, welcome back to Sports Forgotten Heroes. So glad you could join us once again. It's great to be here, and uh, it's really good to talk to you, Warren, and hope everybody listening is having a good day. Absolutely. Hey, how is it that guys like Tom Fears get lost and are not remembered like many of us think they should be? This guy's a Hall of Famer, not should he be in the Hall of Fame? He's a Hall of Famer, and he sort of is forgotten. You know, has, has his his career has faded with time. How is it that guys like this get lost? Well, Tom Fears, and we're going to talk about all of his stats and all the things that I think make him special, but he played – across the line from a guy named Elroy Crazy Legs Hirsch, Mm -hmm. who is also in the Hall of Fame and wasn't a bad player either. (laughs) And so you put that together, and some guys remember better than others, and a really cool nickname sometimes puts you ahead. Mm -hmm. Good, good summary. So who was Tom Fears, and just how good a football player was he? Uh, I'll tell you. uh, You know, we could do three hours on Tom Fierce, but <laughs> to, to put it in, into, into capsule form, let's remember that, first of all, he's the first native of Mexico ever to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. He's not the first Hispanic to play in the NFL. As far as I know, that's a guy named Ignacio Moline, uh, who is a native of Cuba, played for the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets in 27. But Fierce is still a, a pioneer in terms of people from Mexico playing in the in the NFL and in the Hall of Fame, and uh, he was, a, I believe, the first Mexican coach, head coach in the NFL, mm-hmm. first Mexican-born head coach. So he's important for that reason, if nothing else. But then you put on top of that the great years that he had in the early 1950s and mid-1950s with the Rams and Norm Van Brocklin and Bob Waterfield and the Bull Elephant backfield and, and Elroy Hirsch on the other side. And you take a look at that team and all the points they put on the scoreboard, and with with a nod to Kurt Warner and Isaac Bruce and Marshall Falk, this really was the greatest show on turf. Mm. And they they won it. Well, they played in a couple of championships, and they won a championship. And we'll get into all of that. I think one of the more interesting facts about Tom's life is how he wound up in the NFL. The research I've done shows that Tom played high school ball and one year of college football at Santa Clara University. Then, like so many, he had to go fight in World War II. And he was sort of actually looking forward to it. He wanted to be a fighter pilot to help rescue his father, 
who was a POW in Japan. But that never materialized. What happened? How did his father end up being a POW, if you know that? And why was Tom never able to achieve his goal of becoming a fighter pilot? Well, he was never allowed uh, to become a fighter pilot because he was too good a football player, and they <laughs> put him on a base football team. You and I have talked about service ball mm-hmm. uh, in the 40s and 50s and, and all the great players that came from there and the great coaches. And uh, the reason that Fears never got to realize his goal of being a fighter pilot and maybe going to rescue his father or at least avenging his father was the fact that uh, somebody put him on a base football team because of his uh, superlative high school career, and then one year at Santa Clara. Uh, and, you know, uh, someone saw him, wanted him, put him on their team to make the team look good and, and also make sure a hero didn't get uh, didn't have any misfortune during the war. So that's the reason that he never became a fighter pilot. Mm-hmm. He probably would have been a good one. And in a movie, he played one. Yeah, exactly. A uh, movie called Action in the, in the North Atlantic. Um, what I'm interested to know, was he a flight instructor by name only or did he actually know how to fly and where did he learn to fly well if he wasn't a pilot then he i don't think he could have been a flight instructor <laughs> he he might have been able to teach some of the subject you know a lot of a lot of uh, aeronautics have to do with mathematics so he could have been a mathematics instructor mm-hmm. uh, but uh, in terms of being a flight instructor, you have to be a pilot first. So I, I don't believe he was a flight instructor. He might have been involved in a program mm. uh, to develop pilots, but I don't believe he was a flight instructor. Okay. And his dad, by the way, was captured. The story I, I found was um, somehow his father was in the Philippines working as a civilian in mining and Japan, you know, uh, I guess uh, went over there and got those guys and called them prisoners of war. I believe he was part of the Bataan Death March, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yes, his father was a miner. That's how uh, Fear's father met Fear's mother. His father was a mining engineer in Mexico Mm -hmm. and uh, met Tom's mother, and uh, they got married, and a few years later, Tom came along, so... Uh, he was a miner, and uh, then he got uh, uh, moved to the Philippines to do the same type of work, mining engineering. Mm-hmm. And uh, wrong place, wrong time. Yeah. And when the uh, Japanese invaded the Philippines, there he was. Yeah, and Tom never got the opportunity to go rescue him. What a story that would have been. Hey, um, yeah, but let's let's also realize that there were a lot of really outstanding pilots that did fight in the Pacific for the United States and the Allies who didn't come home. Sure. So, uh, although we we look at it and we say, well, it's too bad he didn't get a chance to accomplish his dream. Uh, sometimes those dreams end in tragedy too. Absolutely. So Tom played for a service team in Colorado Springs. What can you tell us about that and? How did the Rams take notice? And, you know, what sold the Rams on Tom to wind up selecting him in the draft? Well, they were aware of him because he was a California guy. And as you noted, he played, played at Manual Arts High School, which is one of the then and now one of the top uh, uh, football programs, high school football cro- programs in Southern California. And then he went to Santa Clara University, which is in Northern California, mm-hmm. so he really wasn't too far away from the Rams mm-hmm. And for one year. And, uh, and uh, then when he got inducted into the service, uh, they already had this knowledge of him, and um, he also attracted the attention of the coaches at UCLA because before he got out of the service, they signed him to play there. Mm-hmm. So uh, he, was, he was just a very well-known uh, ball player at that time, and He was actually selected by the Rams when they finally got him as a defensive back. Mm, Interesting. So so he's selected by the Rams, but he didn't go straight to the pros. He, like you said, went to go play at UCLA. Why not go to the Rams right away? Why go back and go to college? 
Well, there's a few things at play here. The the first thing is that uh, Fear said that uh, because UCLA offered him a scholarship before the Rams offered to sign him, UCLA was first, he had already signed, and so he went with uh, an agreement he had already agreed to. So there's there's some you know honoring agreement, and also you have to remember that in 1948, pro football was not the rich man, uh, you know, is not the a rich man builder that it is today. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, he said that when he went from college ball to pro ball, he actually took a pay cut. <laughs> so because he was uh, working he in had, the movies on the side, right? He he was, and uh, also he got his picture taken. He was working for a clothing store. He and some teammates. And uh, they had a photograph taken, and they were used in a billboard. And the NCAA came down; they were going to, you know, get them in trouble. And and uh, they were able to show that at no time in the advertisement were they were they identified as football players. They're just identified as as people who worked at the store, and they were just models of the clothing lines. So they didn't get any trouble there, but they they were getting paid. They were able to work. And then, of course, his job with uh, with the Hollywood uh, production studio, you know, got him in a film with uh, Humphrey Bogart. He's on film for six seconds and made enough money that uh, I guess it helped him get through college. Uh huh. How did he end up in the movies? Do you know how how was he discovered? Did he go try out? Did somebody find him? Do you know anything about how that came about? It's not uncommon for, in fact, it happened to John Wayne. It's not uncommon for athletes in uh, the schools in Southern California to have an opportunity to go work on a movie lot or to get seen uh, by somebody in a social setting or a head coach is a friend of a guy in the movies, uh, which I believe is what what happened for Fears. But uh, it is not an uncommon thing in those days for that to happen. So... uh, you know, it's. I believe that his head coach at UCLA was somebody who was familiar with people in the movie industry, and and got him uh, got him a part time gig, and that ended up with him uh, uh, getting on screen for six seconds. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, in the end, yeah. at the end of his at the end of his career, and we're going to get into this, that actually hurt his career. Yeah, um, it sure did. Being involved in the movie industry hurt him. Yep, yep. He was sort of blackballed from the NFL, intentionally or not. Um, you know, he was something pretty special in college. He was he was an All American both years that he played for the Bruins, and then he made his way to the Rams. So when the Rams drafted him originally, did that mean they got to keep his rights no matter how long it took him to get to the NFL, or did the in Rams those days have it to? Did. Okay, so so here's a funny question for you. If you were, and and maybe this did happen, if you're an NFL team and you see someone, I guess back in those days, as a freshman, you really didn't play college, you know, varsity ball. You only played starting your sophomore year. So if you saw somebody in their sophomore year who was that good, did teams go out and draft a player like that or did they still wait to the senior year? Well, there were some rules regarding how you could draft players and when you could draft them and, and then uh, they had some ways that you had to do it your graduating class had to be at a certain point um, but it's it's a it's sort of a gray area that's how the Rams got Norm Van Brocklin uh, everybody else thought that Van Brocklin uh, still had another year of college to go but the Rams knew he had been in college for four years, and so mm. technically his graduating class had already finished and had matriculated, and so they drafted Van Brocklin when no one else thought he was eligible. Wow. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it, sometimes it's real important to do your homework. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The Rams really, like you said, they drafted him as, as a defensive back, and he developed into one heck of an offensive player. So the Rams really capitalized on that. Um, did they did they know of his offensive talents, or when they drafted him, was it you know this guy's going to be uh, on, on the defensive side of the ball most of the time? I know that players were you know two way players back then, but they really did have his eye on him as a defensive player. Did they not? Yes, and you know, as they say, there are no accidents. Um, they knew about his talent. He was drafted primarily because of his defensive prowess, 
But the head coach of the Rams was Clark Shaughnessy, and, and he was an offensive guy. And uh, Shaughnessy realized during the season, you know, we've got something pretty good here with this guy. And so they plugged him in, and it sure was a good thing they did, uh, you'd have to say, because he ended up with uh, he played 87 football games and caught 400 passes. I mean, yeah. you take a look at that number, and that's yeah. that's pretty impressive in a 12-game season. Sure. You know, his impact on the Rams was immediate. What was, if you can, paint a picture for us of what style of game the NFL generally was at that time and how unique the Rams' offense was at that time and how Tom actually not only fit in but helped develop, as you like to say, the greatest show on turf. Well, you have to, and this is, I think, the question you asked, you have to take a look at the style of play in those days. And Pro football was a tough thing to do. They didn't play with, a lot of guys didn't play with face masks in those days, in the late 40s and early 50s. And those that did, okay, but that didn't really protect them from much because they got mauled. It was just a tough game. There were players like Hardy Brown who who would knock you out just running a pass pattern. He'd knock you out before anything happened, it wouldn't be illegal. Uh, it was a much more uh, defensive game. They didn't score as many points as they do today. And so when the Rams come out and start putting points on the board like uh, an international business puts stamps on an envelope, you really sit up and take notice because they're scoring points in bunches. And so it was a very, very different type of ball club. And they became known as the Hollywood Rams, Mm -hmm. particularly when they lost the 49 and 50 championship games, first to the Eagles and then to the Browns. And uh, you just have to understand that they stood out. And what fears did to help them stand out was, in addition to the fact they had good hands, could catch the ball at better than average speed, he was a route runner non Terrell. He was simply an outstanding route runner. George Allen wrote a book about uh, what he called the 100 greatest football players of all time. And Tom Fears is number six on George Allen's list of Wow. Receivers. And George now, Allen is no slouch. No. In fact, George Allen coached the Rams, the, uh, coached the Rams wide receivers the year after Fears retired. So he knew about Hirsch and he knew about Van Brocklin and he knew about players like that, and, and he had been around the pro game uh, as a, a volunteer assistant with the Rams for a long time, even when he was coaching in college. So if you take a look at not the players that are ranked ahead of Fears, let's, let's just not worry about that. Mm-hmm. The three players ranked that George Allen ranked immediately behind Tom Fears were Paul Warfield, Lance Allworth, and Don Maynard. <laughs> So George Allen says in 1982, this was before a lot of other receivers that we've mm-hmm. seen since, who might, might rank someone else's top ten, George Allen said those guys were not as good as Fears. And he, he said that Fears was, a, uh, was just a great route runner and had great hands, but primarily he was a brilliant route runner. And, you know, George Allen knew football. He must have. Yeah. And uh, he that's what he said, and I'm not going to argue with George Allen. Sure. And and to be ranked above Warfield and Allworth and Maynard is just incredible. No matter how you put a list together or who puts that list together, there's got to be a reason. So where did Tom develop this offensive game and this route running perfection that he had I mean after all again the Rams and everybody else really saw him first as a defensive player where was this offensive game developed how was it developed well the uh the really big scoring teams the Rams were coached by Joe Steidahar he was the head coach in 50 and 51 but his assistant was a guy named Hampton Poole who had an offense called the fly T offense. And in that offense, both Fears and Hirsch and Waterfield and Van Brocklin just flowered and became these tremendous stars and great players. And it was within that offense, which was basically a running offense, that they developed um, their style of play. Fierce is a great uh, route runner. 
I don't mean to say that Hirsch was not a great route runner, mm-hmm. but that's not what he was best known for. But uh, you would have these two guys who would have such distinctly different styles of play, and they were every bit as difficult for the defenses to work with. I mean, who do you double? <laughs> if you yeah. double Hirsch, you can't double Fears. If you double Fears, Hirsch is gone for 60. That's That was the thing. And by the way, if you double both of them, okay, they're going to bring in the bull elephants, which is what they call their big offensive running backs, and they're going to just run right through you. So this was a tough offensive team. Now, if you want to take a look at the difference between Fears and Hirsch, which Fears was, he was a little bit defensive about, and I can understand that. Elroy Hirsch um, played for the Chicago Rockets of the old All-American Football Conference. When he got to the NFL, he averaged 18.4 yards of reception. He averaged better than 20 yards of catch three times during his career. Fears like to point out that there wasn't much difference between their average yards per reception. Fears averaged 13 and a half yards a catch, which is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe a little less than is five yards less than, than what Hirsch had, but that's still pretty good. But if you look at the postseason, the Rams during Fears' uh, career, and the same for Hirsch, played in six postseason games. Elroy Hirsch did not score a touchdown in any of those games. Fears averaged 19.1 yards a catch over his 30 receptions during those six games. He scored five touchdowns. In his four championship games, he had 16 catches, 313 yards. Wow. In their 1950 divisional playoff game against the Bears that they needed to win to get into the championship game, he caught three scoring passes of 43, 68, and 27 yards. Wow. In the clutch, Tom Fears delivered. And let's remember, in 1951 fourth quarter, Rams are trailing the Browns. Van Brocklin hits Fears for a 73-yard touchdown scoring play. And on that play, Fears has to go up and catch the ball up in the air. Two Browns defensive players collide with each other trying to get to the ball, and Fears is gone. He was not slow. Mm-hmm. The idea that maybe he was a route runner and wasn't fast, that's only because he wasn't fast as Hirsch was, but that doesn't mean he was slow. He was quick also. Mm-hmm. He was gone. And that's the play that got the Los Angeles Rams their only NFL championship. Right. They won a title in St. Louis. They won another one in Cleveland. But they've yeah. only won one in Los Angeles, and they won it on Tom Fears' catch. Sure, sure. And like I said, his impact with the Rams was immediate. I mean, his first year, he led the NFL in receptions from his split-end position with 51 catches for four touchdowns. His second and year. And 698 yards. And, exactly. And his second year, forget it, led the NFL again with 77 catches, which at the time set a new record. And he scored nine touchdowns. But it was his game on December 3rd, 1950, where he set a record that wouldn't be topped until Terrell Owens did so in 2000. Tell us about the game that I'm referring to against the Green Bay Packers. Well, Fears had himself a day. <laughs> yeah, you could say that. But but it's but we have to take a look at it within context again. It's not just Fears, it's the entire offense, yes, Fears had the numbers, but the Rams' offense was such that you, you, you pick the thing that you're going to try and stop and know that the other thing is going to beat you. And that's, that's the kind of team that the Rams had. They had all those Hall of Famers on that ball club, and somebody was going to beat you. And so they, the Packers were not as good a team in those days as they would become under Vince Lombardi. They tried to stop one thing, and the Rams beat them to death with something else. Yeah, they sure did. They beat him that something else was Tom Fears. Exactly right. 18 receptions, 189 yards, two touchdowns, in a 51-14 drubbing of the Packers. The NFL had never seen anything like this before. And they very seldom ever saw 51 points total between the two teams on the scoreboard. The Rams routinely put 51 up or 60 or 70. That was not uncommon for the teams 
between 49 and 52. That happened a lot with those with that offense. It was just a bludgeoning at times. How difficult was it for the rest of the NFL to match up against the Rams? I mean, there was the one team, the Cleveland Browns, who were still one of the, you know, they they were this incredible machine from the AAFC that carried over into the NFL when the NFL took them along with the Niners and I guess in a way the Colts. Um, but how how difficult was it to play against these Rams? Uh, you know, forget that, you know, if they couldn't beat you with the run, they're going to beat you with the pass. If they can't beat you with the pass, they're going to beat you with the run. Teams had never seen a passing offense like this. They had not. And, I, I you know, you talk about the Cleveland Browns with Otto Graham and, and Marion Motley and, and those great Dante Lavelli and those great receivers and great players. They also had great defensive players. Leon Hart mm-hmm. was a tremendous defensive end. And, you know, he'd wreck your quarterback's day in a hurry. They, the Cleveland Browns were this – they played in ten consecutive championship games spread out over two uh, leagues. Mm-hmm. You know that that doesn't happen by some accident. They had a great coach in Paul Brown. So what they did was they matched up well enough against the Rams' scoring machine uh, defensively. I say well enough. They didn't stop them, but they did slow them down when they played. And uh, Cleveland was no slouch offensively either. They had basically the same type of one-two punch with Motley and those receivers, but they also had Otto Graham who. In addition to being a great throwing quarterback, he was not afraid to run the football either. Mm-hmm. And you know, a tough guy and, and all those great things you want from a Hall of Fame quarterback. And that's, that's Otto Graham. Uh, you know, he was uh, the Cleveland answer to Van Brocklin and Waterfield, except he was one guy and instead of two. He was just – I don't think he gets credit enough for being such a great winner, such a great championship quarterback. And you put all that together, and you have two teams that went at it hammer and tong and played some very memorable football games. When the Rams lost in 1950 in the title game, it was by a field goal on the last play. Mm -hmm. And when they won the championship the following year in 51, they won because of that great pass in the fourth quarter, the 73-yarder we already talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, the Browns tried to come back on that deal. They had some time left on the clock, and if you're a Rams fan sitting in the L.A. Coliseum, you're saying to yourself, uh-oh, Otto Graham's got some time left. Mm-hmm. It didn't work out for him that one time. But they matched up very well with the Rams, in, and I think part of it was the coaching from the great Paul Brown. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, back to Tom Fears. So, in, like we said, he, he set the NFL record with 77 catches in 49. In 1950, he has this – just this ridiculous game where he, you know, against the Packers where he catches 18 passes for 189 yards. Overall, he set the record with 84 receptions, 1,116 yards and seven touchdowns. And by the way, he averaged 93 yards per game. How crazy are those numbers those are great numbers today. Back then, I mean, that's craziness. Well, it's and it's also crazy that he had 1,116 yards in a 12-game season. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's just... They're playing 16 now, and, and that's, that's still a good number. Yeah, well, no Tom doubt. Fears was, uh, among other things, he, he had great hands. He understood the game very well, so he knew... Uh, you know, the type of patterns that he had to run when he'd see a defense. Usually in those days, the defenses were a 44 front or a 52 front. And, uh, you know, they would try and stop you on the line of scrimmage, but Fears was a tough enough guy to get through that. Then he'd run a, a pattern that would get himself open. And he had such great synchronization with the two quarterbacks, Waterfield and Van Brocklin. They understood where he was going to be uh, on a given play. And they could always go to him, you know, okay, I know fear is going to be open. He'll do this. He'll shake the guy. He'll get off the line of scrimmage. And I know if I have a tough time throwing the ball, he'll go up and catch it. He just had those great hands. So when you put together the trust that the quarterback has with the ability to get off the line of scrimmage and a good set of hands, 
you know, I, I, plus good speed. I, you, <laughs> you just don't see that every day, even in today's football. Mm-hmm. Now, now, Lee, he was six foot two, two hundred sixteen pounds. Um, in today's game, that's not exactly big. What was that like back then? And what kind of matchup difficulties did that cause for opposing defenses? Well, as I say, they, they liked in those days, defenses like to try and stop you from getting off the line of scrimmage. The Rams did not flank their uh, wide receivers out very wide. In the fly T offense, they were a little bit closer to uh, the uh, tackles than uh, you would typically see in today's game. He was a little bit closer to the, to the uh, rest of the offense, and it was a little bit easier for the defenses to stack up in front of him. But he was big enough and strong enough, even uh, for that era. In today's day, game, he'd, he'd be a big, strong guy. He was able to bull his way through, get off and run his patterns. Um, they wouldn't delay him like they might have delayed other wide receivers who were maybe not as large or physically imposing. But he was a big, strong guy, and for the era, six two sixteen is is pretty doggone big. So uh, he was he was that combination of tall enough to get up high, good hands, good route runner, um, gonna be open, dependable. Didn't miss many games, very few games. He was most of his career he played. So uh, he was just one of those guys that quarterbacks love to have around. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now. I want to talk about the team itself. You mentioned some great names. Let's talk about those teams from the late 40s and early 1950s. Let's, let's first start. There's four players in particular. Elroy, Crazy Leg Her- Hirsch, like you mentioned. Bob Waterfield and Norm Van Brocklin. Um, those two guys sort of split duties as quarterback, you know, Waterfield was the guy, then Van Brocklin. Ultimately, Van Brocklin took over. I did a uh, uh, podcast about Waterfield several years ago. Um, tell us a little bit about the style of those three players. And then I got a fourth one I want to ask you about because it's a fun one. All right. Well, uh, as I we talked about the fly T offense, it was it was a offense built around running the football uh, with a lot of uh, great backfield faking and trickery and, and slick ball handling. And he had a couple of really great professionals, Van Brock and Waterfield, who, who were able to do that. But um, the Rams had, um, and we're going to talk about some of these other players, I know, but they also had a back named Dick Horner, who doesn't get a, a lot of attention from people. Mm-hmm. But he was a big, strong guy. He was fast. And, you know, he would run through you. Um, and that's that's the type of thing that the Rams can do to you. They could make you think you were going to do one thing and then go do something else, and you'd be caught not ready for it. So, And in, in those days, the game itself was different, Warren, because the roster was much smaller. You didn't have specialists like we have in the game today. And that really sort of forced the hands of some of the other teams. They just simply didn't have the players uh, to stop what the Rams had. And a lot of the Rams running backs were also linebackers. In fact, they were starting linebackers, some of them. Mm-hmm. Well, the other guy I want to I wanna ask you about is um, an interesting guy. He's someone who is not really recognized for his accomplishments in the NFL, but he played for a couple of years, 1950 when they lost to the Browns and 51 when they beat the Browns. And the guy had a decent career those two years. Glenn Davis. How did he contribute? How did he contribute to the team? I find that really interesting. We always hear about his great days at army, but you never hear about what he did in the pros. Well, Glenn Davis is one of those guys who was a little bit before his time, they called him Mr. Outside when he was at the Army. Doc Blanchard was Mr. Inside, mm-hmm. he was Mr. Outside. And he had uh, good speed, but people don't understand that even on that team with Fears and Hirsch, Glenn Davis could catch the ball coming out of the backfield, too. He was one of those uh, multiple-tool individuals. He could run the football, he could run it between the tackles, he could run it around end. Uh, you could use him as a, you know, you could fake to him. You're going to have to attract attention because of his speed. And 
if you leave him alone, Van Brocklin hit him in the hands, you know, and he'd catch it. Uh, he was one of those multiple tool individuals who, like you say, doesn't get much attention, but he was on a team full of Hall of Famers. Mm-hmm. And how much? And there's only one football. How much attention can you give everybody? <laughs> you just can't. But you know, I had a, a friend of mine once tell me that you know, uh, if if I'd been on that team, he says, if I'd been the greatest player of all time, no one would have ever known it because there's only one football. Mm. And I think that that's the case for Glenn Davis. There's only one football, and he could every star had to touch it a little bit because of what they did to the defense, and he just probably didn't get the attention he might have gotten uh, because of uh, everybody else that was on that ball club. Yeah, I'm looking at his numbers now. In 1950, he ran for 416 yards and scored three touchdowns out of the backfield catching it. 42 receptions for 592 yards and four touchdowns. 51, he didn't have as much action. He still did rush the ball 64 times for 200 yards and a touchdown and came out of the backfield. Eh, Only caught the ball eight times for 50 yards. So there was definitely... um, uh, uh, The ball couldn't be spread around enough. Getting back to, uh, to, to our friend here, Tom Fears. So in 1950, the Rams lose to the Browns in the championship game, 30 to 28, I believe the final score was. He had nine catches for 136 yards in that game. In the 51 yep. championship, the game that we've already talked about, where he scored on the 73 yarder in the fourth quarter, he caught the ball four times for 146 yards. As you noted earlier, he came to play in these big games. What was it about his game, his personality, that helped him elevate in such crucial situations? Well, I think part of it is, and when we talk about elevating, I think part of it is is his size. Um, He was a large, strong guy, so he was easy to find for the quarterback. But I also think that you have to go back to the championship game mentality. If you're a head football coach and you've got Elroy Hirsch and Tom Fears on, on the two sides, Hirsch is the guy that catches the long ball. He's the guy that can sting you the worst on a single play, you think. Maybe he's the guy you pay the most attention to. And that leaves Fears open in a championship situation. And Fears is one of those guys who simply knows how to win. And, you know, we we talk about great tools, we talk about great uh, physical attributes, but sometimes that mental outlook is just as important. And I think that in Fear's case, the mental outlook that he was going to, you know, I'm going to do this, he had that championship attitude that just elevated his game in pressure situations. We've seen other players like that throughout the history of the game. We've talked about Otto Graham, he's another one. But Fears just had that way about him of making things work in difficult situations. And if everyone's paying attention to the other guy, you might as well be the one they throw it to, right? I mean, if if everybody's doubling Elroy Hurst because of the championship game, Tom Fears is going to get open. Mm-hmm. And his quarterbacks knew it. Now, was there anything to the fact that for Fears, it was somewhat of a short season, 51? I believe he only played in seven games that year. I think he held out and ultimately decided to come in. It would be later on when he would get hurt. What was the hold? Uh, obviously, it was probably about money, but what kind of leverage did he have back then, and how did that affect his relationship with the team if it did? Well, ball players usually want a guy to get the best deal he can get. And so, it, you know, with teammates, it doesn't usually – uh, bothered them all that much. He, yeah, he wanted more money um, than the Rams were willing to give him, and uh, eventually he came back to the ball club just in time uh, to help him win a championship. But I also think that there was another thing uh, that played against him, and that is that the Rams were winning without him. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's some pressure there, too. Uh, you know, they're winning without me. Uh, he, eventually he got a little something from, from management, but the the point is that um, he had two things that, you know, one working for him, and that was that 
uh, they they knew that he, of his talent and what a great player he was. But the thing working against him was the Rams were winning anyway. So you take a look at that, and well, maybe I better get back. Yeah, you know the the, the thing that strikes me about it is he's in the prime of his career, and I get it. There's holdouts all the time, but I can't help but think that this particular holdout. When he was 29 years old, he's coming off his first three years, 51 receptions for 698 yards, 77 receptions for 1,013 yards, 84 receptions for 1,116 yards, comes back, basically plays half a season. So if you look at it and you multiply, he would have had 64 receptions for, or just around 60 receptions for just over a thousand yards. He never really put up those gaudy numbers again. I mean, afterwards in 1952, he played all 12 games, but only had 48 receptions for 600 yards. And then 1953 is when he got hurt. So um, I, I, I just, I, I wonder how much that holdout really affected him. And maybe it's not from the physical side. It's more from the side of, as you said, they had all this other firepower and they were winning without him. So maybe the team didn't work him into the game as much as they needed to earlier. Well, you go back and you look at the numbers and in seven games, third two receptions, 528 yards. That's not bad. No, I'm, I'm saying so, that, that that equates to almost 60 receptions and probably right around 1,000 yards. Yep. And, you know, it's hard to say what might have happened. You can't, in fact, say what might have happened. All we know is what did happen. And as you say, that was maybe for him that was the year that might have been. But I would imagine if you said to Tom Fears, look, you're going to have 32 receptions, 528 yards, and you're going to win a championship, he said, I'll take the ring. Thank you very much. Because <laughs> no Fears was about winning. You know, he, This was not a man who took losing lightly, and nor was his coach, Joe Steidehar. And I think that Fears uh, embodied a little bit of Steidehar's spirit. Mm-hmm. What about... Um defense. He was recognized for his defensive talents, you know, in college, uh, playing for the service team in Colorado Springs. What was he like on defense in the NFL? Well, in his first game against the Detroit Lions in 1948, he intercepted two passes. (laughs) I believe that those were the only two passes he intercepted in his entire career, but he got off to a heck of a start. And uh, one of them, he returned for a touchdown. And the legend is that his touchdown return uh, sparked Clark Shaughnessy, the head coach, into thinking maybe we should concentrate a little bit more on offense with this man <laughs> because, because he had such a great run back. I have never seen video of that play. Uh, frankly, I don't know that it exists, but I would, I would like to see it just to see what, what the legend does in terms of reality. Mm-hmm. But... Um, he was, uh, at, at the time, he was a really good defensive player, and that's how he got selected selected as a defensive player, but clearly uh, his strength was on offense. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about the fact that he was the first Mexican-born person to play in the NFL. Did that come with any difficulty? Do you know if he wore that notoriety proudly? Did it mean anything back then? And did he face any sort of, I hate to use the word racism, um, or issues because of his background? I haven't found anything like that. And he spent most of his playing career, in fact, most of his life, except for when he's in the service, in Southern California, which has a very rich and uh, copacetic um, history of, of good relations between uh, Hispanics and, and, and Americans, uh, you know, white Americans. So uh, I would say that, you know, I haven't found any that was directly um, pointed at him. I, I'm not aware of any, but um, 
you would have to say that it, given everything we've seen in history, this is a man who uh, should be celebrated on, uh, you know, on, on many, many different ways. And in one way uh, is that he was of Mexican heritage, at least on his mother's side. And that's a glorious thing to celebrate. He was not the, uh, the last one, I can tell you that much. Mm. I remember growing up when the Rams had a punter and a place kicker named Danny Villanueva, who was from a family of Mexican descent. And uh, he was very popular uh, in Los Angeles. And I ended up meeting a brother of his who, who had a lot of fun stories to tell about uh, their father, who was a preacher, and, and uh, their, their upbringing um, on both sides of the border. Just a wonderful family. And so my feeling is that Fears had many of those same, uh, same feelings and same stories. And I have not heard of anything on the negative side. I would certainly hope there weren't, but... Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I just know that what a rich heritage he had. Mm-hmm. Now, 1953 was really the beginning of the end, and it wasn't because of his talent diminishing or his physical skills diminishing. He got hurt. He fractured two vertebrae in a game against 19 against the Detroit Lions in 1953, and and that really. Um, affected him the rest of his career. Especially in those days, because medicine, you know, sports medicine in particular, is nothing like it is today. And uh, so it, it, that really was a very important um, aspect of, of the later part of his career was that he had, had that injury, and, and uh, they don't heal. Uh, at least they, the, the medicine wasn't as good then. It was much more difficult to come back from something like that. But it's interesting that you bring that up because people forget that in, I believe it was 1947, when he was playing for the Chicago Rockets, Elroy Hirsch had a fractured skull, and he came back from that. So uh, two pretty tough guys playing wide receiver for the Rams in those days. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is, that, like I said, that was really started to, to signal the end of his career and the Rams weren't exactly a great team moving forward. They might have made one other championship appearance. I, I, I think they uh, played again in 1955 against the Browns. That's correct, 1955 against the Browns again. And here's something, Warren, that we don't think about much, and we really should. Uh, Tom Fears played for four different head coaches. He played for Clark Shaughnessy. Uh, he played for Joe Steidahar. Steidahar got fired after the first game of the 52 season. One game after winning the championship, he's fired, and they uh, <laughs> elevate Hampton Poole to become the new head coach. And in 55, Sid Gilman was the coach. That's five head coaches in one career. Uh, four head coaches, I should say, in one career. That's That's a lot of different changes to go through. Not only that, for a team that was basically of championship pedigree, Right, because they made the championship in '50, they won the championship in '51, they returned to the championship in '55, all three games, ironically, against the Cleveland Browns, um, the city from which they originated. They were actually the the Cleveland Rams. How did the offensive scheme change over that period, and how did that affect the game that Tom Fears was used to playing? Well, they also made the 49 championship game. They lost to the Eagles in that one. Right. Uh, and Clark Shaughnessy was the head coach, a completely different offense. Uh, Joe Steiderhart took over, and he ran an offense closer to what he had uh, played with when he was with the Chicago Bears. And then Hamp Poole was the assistant, and they ended up using Poole's offense. And then when Poole became the head coach, they strictly used his fly T offense all the way through until 55. Sid Gilman's offense was completely different, a radical departure uh, from what the Rams had been running, and Hirsch and Fears and some of the others were unhappy about it because in uh, Poole's offense, they would have an area of the field they were supposed to get to at a specific point in the play, but it was not tightly scripted how they got there. So if they got up on the line of scrimmage and saw the defense was a certain way, they would sort of run this sort of pattern to get to the spot where they were supposed to be. In Gilman's offense, 
you took this many steps to get here. Then you cut at this degree to go there, and at this point you turn and the ball will be in your face. That's the way that Gilman's offense was, and, and the veteran players really didn't like it because it was so very, very different. So the answer to your question is that it affected his career in that when he finally got to the end of his career and there was this radical change, he didn't play very long. He, he played in 55 and then just two games in 56, and he was done. And and it was it wasn't again because of a lack of talent. He just wasn't happy with the way the offense was being run. There was really he was left out. Yeah, he was, and he was unhappy about that. Now by this time, he's no longer the young guy. Sure. Let's remember this is nineteen fifty six. He's by NFL standards an older player at this point. And so uh, maybe the skills have diminished a little bit. Certainly the hands have not gone away and the ability to catch the ball. And he's probably as strong, but he had that back issue from the injury that we talked about earlier. So there were a lot of things working against it. But I think by 56, Tom Fears had put his body through enough. He was an older player. There were other things that he could do. And he finally decided 56 would be his final season. Sure, he was 34, um, but as you had mentioned, he was a football lifer. He was far from being done with football. Um, he became a coach, uh, and he had quite a long career as a coach. But before I go there, I do want to circle back around for one other thing. You mentioned a name earlier, George Allen. And George Allen ranked Tom Fears, as you said, as his sixth best player of all time. Sixth but, best wide receiver. Six best, I'm sorry, sixth best wide receiver of all time. But there wasn't there some sort of issue between Fears and Allen? No, George became a, an assistant coach for the Rams in 1957. Oh, you're talking about when Fears was the coach of the, of the Saints. Okay, yeah, so it came later, yes. Yeah, oh, and there was, oh, it was a good one, too. <laughs> there was a difference between them. And that was when George Allen was the head coach of the Los Angeles Rams. And Tom Fears was a head coach of the New Orleans Saints. He filed a complaint, a complaint with the league against Allen and accused him of spying. He said that George Allen was spying on his Saints, and he had all these reasons for saying so. And um, without accusing anybody of doing anything... I will simply point out that George Allen was an assistant coach under George Hallis, who was not afraid of spying on people. <laughs> and also, he was an assistant coach for one year under Sid Gilman, who was occasionally accused of spying on teams. And so I would simply say that uh, George Allen certainly uh, did some um, learning under coaches who were also accused of the same thing. And it was very serious. Fears was, was very unhappy about it. He was interviewed after a ball game and uh, accused the Rams of, of sending players, uh, not players, but um, uh, administrators out to sit in trees and watch the Saints practice. Sort of like Spygate. A little bit like Spygate. Yeah, maybe <laughs> Spy Tree, you know, but um, that's. Uh, it was definitely there, and, and Fears making this accusation against his former team was a rare thing for him because you know he was still very much a uh, hero in Los Angeles and well thought of, and, and uh, I don't think he had any real bad feelings about the Rams uh, franchise. He had good feelings about them. So for him to make that accusation, uh, he had to be very angry. But remember, mm -hmm. he was a man for whom winning was very important. Mm -hmm. And even as coach of the ex expansion, New Orleans Saints, um, he didn't like losing for any reason. And if he thought someone did something, he was he was not afraid to say where he was unhappy about it. Well, losing certainly came with the Saints, and it came often. Tom, you know, he started his career as an assistant coach in 59 with the Packers, went back to the Rams, then he went on to the Falcons. And then he was named the first head coach of the New Orleans Saints. He won just 13 games over, I think it was three plus years. How tough was that? How tough is it for someone who is so used to winning to have to go through something like that? What was Tom Fears like as a coach? 
Well, he was not happy at uh, with a record of 13, 34, and 2. Remember, he coached for Lombardi in 59 and went back to the Rams in 60 and 61 as an assistant. Then went back to the Packers again for three more years. Then was an assistant with the Falcons. So he understood what winning looked like. He also understood having uh, coached with the Falcons, what it was like to be with an expansion team. So he knew what he was getting himself into. But uh, he was uh, so dedicated to winning, so determined to win, that uh, coaching the Saints was a very difficult thing for him. And when when it finally ended, uh, he was simply, he was probably happy to leave. He was not happy to get fired. Nobody ever is. But he was probably happy to get away from a losing situation. And, you know, 13, 34, and 2, really, when you look at it for an expansion team, the first few years of existence, that's not really all that bad. Yeah, I think Tampa would have really loved to have 13 wins over their first couple of seasons. John McKay would have had some great quotes, quotes had he won 13 games the first three years. <laughs> yeah, no years. doubt. It didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, through all of this, did Tom have a family? What was his family life like? I haven't researched his family a whole lot, but um, he was – he was a football lifer, and when you're when you're related to a football lifer, the game sort of takes its part of you every moment, and that's that was the case with Fear. So it was not always easy for him, uh, for his family to be with him, because for so much of the year, he was so heavily involved in the game one way or another as a coach, or uh, he had a scouting service, and that certainly took him on the road. It's not easy to be involved with a man uh, or as a father or a husband who has gone so much. And that's, that's the same then as it is now. It's, that's a very difficult thing to have uh, be part of your life because to some degree you know you're always going to be number two uh, to the game of football. That's the way it works. It's, it's such an intricate game, and you need to know so much. It's really, it's, it's just an incredible, you have to have an incredible dedication to want to be in this game and to really to succeed in this game. I just marvel at guys like a Don Shula who coached for so long, Bill Belichick, even though he's going through a, a bad season for some, a good season, but for him, a bad yeah. season, um, after all that success, you know, these guys, they eat, they literally eat, drink and sleep football. It's just this crazy obsession. And you wonder what it is in their mental makeup that makes them that way. And like you said, Tom was a lifer. He left the Saints, became a head coach in the World Football League with the Southern California Sun. He worked in the college ranks worked in player personnel for the L.A. Express of the USFL. He even coached overseas for a team in Milan in the International League of American Football. I mean, this guy was completely obsessed with football. And he was pretty good at it, too. You know, he, he had a winning two winning seasons with the Southern California Sun, mm -hmm. uh, maybe not the strongest league uh, in the end because they ended up going out of business, but uh, he had two good seasons with that ball club. And so as, when we talk about his time with the Saints and how difficult for him it was, let's remember that he was a winner with the Sun. So uh, the man could coach, and he knew the game, and he was, he was highly respected. Mm -hmm. And in addition to coaching in, in Italy and, and in the World League and all every other league you can think of, he coached at the junior college level. He coached at Chapman College, which is a small Division three school in Southern California. It might have been NAIA at that time. Mm -hmm. And he was also a part owner of the Orange Empire Outlaws of the California Football League in 1981. It was a very, very high-level minor league in those mm. days. I, I happened to see some of those games. And uh, I remember that when NFL teams would make their cuts, some of those players would come to the California League. Some of them played for the Outlaws. Some of them played for the Orange County Rhinos, and there were other teams. This was a very high-level minor league, and I'm not too surprised 
to re recollect to myself that Fears was part of that because um, certainly he would have brought uh, just by his name and the fact that he was there and his determination to do things well, he would have brought a lot of credibility to that outfit. Mm -hmm. And when his coaching days were done, he started a scouting service. And we sort of referenced this way back in the beginning of our conversation. But he was basically blackballed from the game. Why? North Dallas 40. Why? What happened? <laughs> well, uh, his connections with Hollywood never really went away. He had uh, he had various roles in small films, a lot of them about football. And if, if somebody was making a role, uh, a film about football or that referenced football somehow, Tom Fears would be brought in to help bring in some credibility and also make sure they did something that looked, you know, reasonably uh, uh, like an actual football game. And uh, this this movie called North Dallas 40, I think Mac Davis was in it, and I forget who else was in it. but Nick Nolte, uh, I think, it, maybe? Nick Nolte is one of them, yep. And they had, um, it was a controversial film among football people because it talked about uh, drug use. It talked about uh, some other things that uh, no business wants to be associated with. And it billed itself as being, you know, an accurate portrayal of professional football. And, and that's a completely different thing that we can get into another time. But because Fears was involved with this film and because he was a technical advisor, uh, the league and a lot of the teams were very upset with him. His scouting service had three or four teams as clients. And uh, the following season after the film came out, he no longer had any NFL clients. Uh, his scouting service was done because of that. Uh, he was branded as somebody who had uh, uh, misportrayed the NFL or at least made it look bad to the public. And whether it was his fault or not uh, is a completely different question, but certainly um, nobody wanted to have anything to do with North Dallas 40. And so that, that, uh, that ended his business. Mm -hmm. And I know that he went and he spoke to the commissioner at the time, Pete Rosell, and it really didn't result in anything good. I mean, he was blackballed from the game. That must have been, he must have been so stung by that. I just can't imagine a lifer who had given everything to the game like he did was suddenly on the outside looking in. He wasn't welcome anymore particularly since Pete Rosell was a Los Angeles Ram administrator before he came the commissioner. Rosell would have known fears, would have known his, uh, his uh, standing with the community, would have known a lot of things about him, but that didn't do fears any good at all when he talked to the commissioner. No, not at all. Well, he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1970, the first Mexican-born player to get that honor. He's also a member of the College Football Hall of Fame. Despite what happened with his scouting service, how proud was he of his accomplishments? He must have been proud, and he must have worn that golden jacket with such pride. Can you talk at all about what his life was like after the scouting service debacle, his induction into the Hall of Fame? How did he live his final years? Well, without being involved in the game, although he was too, you know, he was in that minor league and he did some other things, but with not being involved in the professional game, the NFL, the very top of, of the ziggurat, um, it did leave a bitter taste in his mouth. And you can understand why. He had given the game his entire life. And he was still involved with the game, but he had given the NFL uh, such a big piece of himself, including a broken back, for heaven's sake. So that left him unhappy, but um, it didn't leave him unhappy with the game itself. He still loved it. And as I say, he coached at those colleges, and he was involved with the minor league, and and uh, he was just one of those guys who couldn't stay away from the game. And the game benefited from him. I, I just really have to say that between uh, his excellence on the field as a ball player, 
between his willingness to make the big play, his, his, his mental aptitude for making the big play at the right time, uh, between being a coach at the pro level and at the college level and, and being involved with the minors, you have to say that, that the game benefited from Tom Fears being a part of it. That's awesome. You know, at the beginning, you said we could spend so much more time talking about Tom Fears. And one thing about um, my podcast, Sports Forgotten Heroes, there are so many times where we just scratch the surface of a phenomenal career. And I sort of feel like that's all we've done with Tom Fears. We could get into so much more, but we've been at it for a while. And Lee, before I do close out today's podcast with you, I would like to talk about the Professional Football Researchers Association, which is where I met you and so many of my other guests. I mean, if you are interested in football and football history, you've got to become a member. Tell us about the PFRA. Well, the PFRA has been around for a long time now. As you know, Warren, you know the history. It's, it's a great organization, and we all work as volunteers. And we study and promote the history of the game of professional football. We have a convention coming up. It's supposed to be in Canton, Ohio, celebrating. It was originally supposed to celebrate the 100th year of the uh, National Football League, but COVID got in the way. So uh, I would encourage people to go to profootballresearchersassociation.com, look us up on the website, and take a look at the convention that we're going to have in Akron, Ohio, in June this year, I believe it's the weekend of the 24th, and uh, we're just going to have a tremendous group of speakers. In fact, I'm one of them, uh, so everyone else will be really good. And <laughs> I, think that, I think that you'll find, if you're a pro football fan, that this is a great group to be a member of. We have a uh, bi-monthly newsletter that comes out called The Coffin Corner. It's got stories about the history of the game. And also, we, uh, we write books. Uh, we have a book coming out next year about the 1951 Los Angeles Rams championship team. And there'll be a uh, nice chapter on, on Tom Fears in that book. And I would encourage people, if you're a football fan, to at least take a look at the PFRA and, and uh, find out what, what we do to study the history of the game. Anybody who wants to write something for the Coffin Corner is welcome to do it. If you go to the website, you can find out how to turn something in. And you don't have to be a member to do it. Anybody can do that. And I would, I would really recommend it. It's a great group of people, both men and women. And it's, uh, we, when we get together every other year, we have a great time. And it's, it's a time to forget about everything except pro football. It, it really is an exciting organization to be a part of. Absolutely. And I'm... heck, you, you get to meet Warren. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed my time being a member of the uh, PFRA. And I'm really looking forward to Canton in June of 2021. Lee, I want to thank you so much for joining me again on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We've had some great conversations over the last couple of years, and I can't wait to be with you in June, and I'm looking forward to having you on again. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you, Warren, and, and I just uh, I, I want to tell everybody that uh, be sure to take a look at the PFRA and be sure to listen to Sports Forgotten Heroes because it's not just about football. Warren talks about every sport. And uh, don't 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 forget to check up on him every once in a while to see what he's got on. You'll have a great time. You'll be uh, you'll be happy you did. Thanks, Lee. Thank you so much. When doing research for sports forgotten heroes, and I stumble across a name like Tom Fears, it always amazes me how a guy that was so good and is in the Hall of Fame after setting so many records is hardly recognized for his accomplishments like a Tom Fears. Come on. How many of you out there really knew much about Fears? I bet very few. And this is a guy who held the NFL record for most catches in a season and in a game. And his years as a coach, despite a losing record, weren't that bad either. What a shame that his association with Hollywood and a fictional movie caused such havoc and ultimately led to him being blackballed from the game he spent so much time contributing to. I'd like to thank my guest today, Lee Elder, for joining me on Sports Forgotten Heroes once again.
Always enjoy talking to Lee as he brings so much to the podcast and always helps uncover more information about the stars I talk about. Next time, I welcome back Gary Webster, and we're going to talk about another star who made quite an impact on the game of professional football, Speck Sanders. And we'll also spend time talking about the long-lost AAFC franchise known as the New York Yankees and the long-lost NFL franchise known as the New York Yanks. That's next time. For now, thanks for listening. Happy New Year to everybody, and I'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football, Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s, Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports, Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.